Hi, I'm Ria Matthews and welcome to the Australian Institute of International Affairs. Today I'm joined with Professor James Piscatori from the Centre of Arab and Islamic Studies and Dr. Vanessa Newby from the Coral Bell School at the Australian National University. And we're going to be talking about a highly significant and complex issue in international affairs today, namely the impact of Islamic extremism on the Middle East and on global politics in general. Thank you to the both of you for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll start with my first question. Um, I'm interested in understanding a bit more about the concept of jihad mm -hmm. and how it's been used by Islamic uh, extremist groups. So uh, I was wondering, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Piscatori, if you could give me a brief definition of the term jihad and whether you see there being an evolution in the understanding of this concept by extremist groups. Good. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, jihad comes um, lexically, it comes from uh, roots which means struggle. So uh, a jihad could have very wide meanings. It could be struggle for social justice, it could be uh, helping orphans and widows, etc. But of course it could also have a violent sort of connotation to it. One of the um, aspects of the subject study of the jihad that we're now uh, focusing on is that the idea has evolved over time. So that the Quranic ideas are in some ways ambivalent. Um, it's really in the medieval period that we have a sort of an emergence of a kind of violent jihad. Mm -hmm. And in the early modern period, a kind of counter to that, which is arguing that jihad, Islam is not inherently violent. Uh, and so we have a couple of strands, and those strands come together in the late 20th century, 21st century, where people can pull on that, where the majority, vast majority of Muslims would argue that there is a, a jihad is more social struggle, struggle for the good against poverty. But of course there's a minority who would argue that not only is jihad to be done in a violent way, um, but the kinds of distinctions that normally held in warfare, such as protection of civilians, and non-civilians uh, no longer apply. Okay, well that's very interesting, thank you. Um, moving on, I'm interested in finding out, um, I, I think you'd agree that uh, the activities of ISIS have definitely been dominating mm. media coverage of the Middle East in recent times, um, but what would you see as um, being you know, the Middle East situation after the decline of ISIS, or what, what do you think should be the primary concern of the Middle East once ISIS does eventually decline? Well, I think um, that question in some ways it centralizes ISIS. We have a lot of other wars going on in the region. We have what's going on in Yemen, which is um, very destructive to an already very poor country. Mm -hmm. And then you've actually got the larger problem of Syria itself. Mm -hmm. And you've also got um, deep sectarian divides in Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then you've also got just to the side of the region, Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So I think um, one of the major problems in the region is, of course, as we know, Iranian, Saudi Arabian uh, rivalry. Yes. Um, that has been, in many ways, fueling a great deal of um, this warfare. Mm -hmm. But um, where ISIS to be disbanded, of course, the first question is, well, where are they going to go? Mm -hmm. And the larger question is, are they going to spread themselves mm -hmm. across the world? Um, so this is an issue that obviously would need to be, uh, would be very pertinent and very prescient in the minds of politicians and policymakers. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the secondary issue of the Middle East itself, which, of course, um, would be to try and stop, end the war in Syria. Uh, and and Yemen um, as quickly as possible, um, and in some ways stabilize the remainder of the region. I and mean, you've still got you know an awful lot of chaos going on in Libya. I mean, mm. We're not even talking about Libya and and, 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 and wobbles in Algeria and and, and you know uh, attacks in Tunisia. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got an awful lot of work to do. But I would stress that 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 the military in this case has need to take a step back and it needs to be much more humanitarian, um, much more nuanced and a lot more looking for local partners that you can work with. For example, in Lebanon, the Lebanese armed forces are, you know, a very good state institution and they need support. Um, so finding those local partners that you can work with, which is not easy, of course, um, but assisting in that way rather than direct interventions. Um, obviously, ending the Syrian war 
is not going to be an easy task. No, could, could I just uh, agree with all of that? Just could I just amplify one point? Um, it does seem to me that the that what we're seeing across the Middle East is a is a staggering number of failed states, mm -hmm. um, and everything that you describe is is indicative of that. Um, so we have the situation of course civil war in Syria. We have Libya disintegrating. We've had Iraq essentially disintegrated. Um, we have the rise of the Taliban again in, in Afghanistan. So that scenario of failed states is something which is very alarming um, and in a sense suggests that the death of an old order and perhaps something new. But just to amplify that particular policy point you were making, um, it does suggest that the military is not the simple solution to it since it involves really collapse of not only a state order but of the internal order in these countries. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, so changing direction a little, I'm interested in seeing your views on how external powers have contributed to the rising extremism in the region. Uh, firstly, would you say the United States' actions since the Second World War have significantly contributed to the rise of extremism in the Middle East? Can I say... Uh, Yes, uh, <laughs> and um, it, directly and indirectly. Okay, so indirectly in the sense of perhaps even earlier, um, you said since the Second World War, so yes. if we're talking, say, from the 50s through the 70s, uh, the pushing of a modernization agenda um, that would not have been sympathetic to the cultural and social rhythms of these societies. That would have caused a, a broader problem. Um, in a more direct way, of course, the military interventions, um, of course, Iraq being the, the primary one, um, but also others, Afghanistan, etc. Um, these would have been seen as, of course, a negative kind of interference in the region and would have played into the hands of those who wanted to or ask for a different kind of order. Um, and just one further thing, the, and we're now seeing this with, say, for example, uh, Obama's strategy in the Middle East. Um, the West has had such a close relationship to authoritarianism mm -hmm. that uh, some people in Western circles and even in, in Washington are beginning to question whether that close relationship is beneficial both to them and to Western states. Yeah, I mean, again, I agree with everything James <laughs> says and some. Um, I think it's important to remember that long before the US was a big regional player, and there's a fantastic book, which I'm sure you'll know, The Peace to End All Peace by David <laughs> Fromkin, which sort of yeah. unpicks the 1922, um, is it Monaco? No, agreement. San Remo, San Remo yeah. yeah. Um, agreement, which Got essentially that. ripped the Middle East apart into these modern states, and as we know, some of those... Some of those constructions are very problematic, especially, let's say, in the case of that arc where you had three very clear sort of organized, organized societies mm. sort of put together. Um, so I'd say that's one thing. Um, and obviously, yes, uh, the US and very much the UK, very instrumental in Iran, for example. Mm -hmm. Just to um, discuss um, Professor Piscatori's point about in Iran, this modernization program, which, yes, was driven by the Shah, but the US and the UK had put him back in after Mossadegh was overthrown in 1953. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there were women who didn't want to go outside because they were used to wearing the veil. And, the, and they didn't feel comfortable not wearing the veil, but it was getting ripped off their heads in the streets. So this sort of accelerated modernization, I completely agree, was very traumatic for societies. Um, and then finally, of course, the, the ever-present, and we, we haven't even mentioned it because it's, we're so sick of it, Israel-Palestine issue, <laughs> um, and the relationship with Israel and the way it's been managed so badly for so long and has provided that raison d'etre for so many of these jihadi groups originally, Absolutely. early on. Um, obviously, it's almost moved past that now, hasn't it? So there are other justifications. But that was always at the root, and everything in the Middle East is connected. Absolutely. No, I, I, I don't want to underscore that point. I didn't want to, I, I should have mentioned it. Absolutely, everyone's reaction, of course, is, is that uh, where does Israel fit into all of this? And of course, in the Islamist canon, and particularly the radical Islamist canon, um, it's just seen as a, another form of, of imperialism, which is distorting the the, the the true nature of a Muslim society. Um, okay. So that would, it would add to the Islamists as well as just to the geopolitical problems. Okay, great, thank you. Um, my final question um, is kind of following on from that. I was wondering if you have, if you agree that the Western policy responses towards 
um, the Islamic world in general have changed significantly or has it been a repetition of old mistakes? I'm, I'm thinking particularly since, you know, the 9-11 attacks, um, has there been a significant change in approach towards the Islamic world? Or? Can, I, can I make a distinction between um, what I think is declaratory policy yes. and sort of, sort of uh, geopolitical mm -hmm. strategy? Mm -hmm. um, in declaratory policy, definitely, okay. definitely, yes. um, really for a long time, and uh, I know we never credit anything, and heaven forbid that I'm doing it now, uh, to Bush Jr., uh, yes. but he said exactly the same thing that Obama had said. Uh, yes. Islam is not the enemy. This is the declaratory policy of the United States. Yes. Islam is not the enemy. So who I've Who's the enemy? The enemy of the, of the radical Islamists, etc. Et so, in that sense, there's been a shift mm -hmm. from, say, the earlier generation, where it would have been just kind of bound up that, that Islam is a problem just because it's an inherently violent mm -hmm. jihadist religion. So, we moved on from that. Um, but in terms of geostrategic policy, <laughs> I'm not so sure there's any great change. Um, and as I, I hinted at, perhaps. Uh, there's the beginning of a shift with Obama, but just to be blunt, it occurs in the last few months of his presidency. Mm -hmm. So he is sitting in Riyadh now, supposedly distancing himself from the Saudi monarchy, mm -hmm. which is meant to be this great shift in American policy. And I suspect that the Saudis are probably ignoring it just biding their time, thinking he's not going to be president for long. Um, so we have, so we're beginning to see some shifts, yes. but not really. And just one more sentence, sorry, just one more sentence. Uh, the, the, the famous errors uh, of U.S. policy are, uh, are no plan B. Um, so you get rid of Saddam, uh, what happens next? You get rid of Gaddafi what happens next. Um, and I hope that there would be some greater consideration of that, and it's not quite clear um, that there has been any, although Obama did say recently that his greatest failure was Libya. Right, okay. So it's more of a rhetorical shift. It's more rhetorical shift, I think. Okay, although there are some indications, would you agree, some indications that it's moving to... Well, the Iran deal was, was Iran a really smart move. Really smart move. Yeah, really smart move. yeah and, exactly. And, um, Although it's created other tensions, as you say, um, it was it, 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 it's it's put a little bit more nuance back into yes. those relationships. Yeah, it's good. Um, that that weren't there before. Although I'm hearing on the grapevine, I don't know if you're hearing this, James, that there's rumbles about intervening and yet again in Libya in some oh, other capacity. Oh yeah, absolutely. And you just think, you know, it is that Einstein's definition of you know the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I was quite shocked, by the way, to see uh, that on, a, on uh, the website of a, one of the big Washington think tanks mm. saying uh, the headline was "Everyone says Libya was a disaster." Uh, it was not, meaning that they that, that they, there is some think tank and not the right wing crazies oh, okay. who who are, <laughs> uh, who are actually saying, um, yeah, okay, so you know it's a mess, mm -hmm. but it will end up in a better way uh, afterwards. So that so it's reaffirming in, in the U.S. policy in that sense. So that that's a bit alarming in a way. Yeah, it seems as though if we let enough time pass by, we can do the same thing all over again, mm -hmm. and it'll work. <laughs> that, that's right. That's um, they just seem to go around in circles, you know, and there was, again, another bit of nuance where, um, and I was actually yeah. in Lebanon at the time, and we were literally waiting for the US jets to fly overhead to bomb after the chemical attack yeah. um, in 2013. So we're all sitting there thinking, I wonder if we'll be able to hear them, you know, like, because of launched from the Mediterranean. Yeah. And at the last minute, you know, David Cameron put a spoke in the wheel by actually trying to get permission, and it was rejected, and it, and it pulled back from that. So there are these moments where you thought, okay, they have learned from the past. It's not necessarily the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but I always get the sense of the Americans, sorry, I should be going on now, but I always get the sense of the Americans that, you know, it is that whole issue of they, you know, the partnerships that they build, whether it's Mubarak and Egypt, whether it's um, the Israelis or whether it's the Saudis, they always end up getting played by their partners more than they do playing. I always feel as though they are more bound up by those yeah, relationships than, than those relationships are bound by them, despite the amount of resources and money that, that, that is coming from America. Yeah, absolutely.
Thank you. What yes. she said. <laughs> thank, you. Well, thank you very much once again. I, I'm sure you'll agree that the issues in the Middle East and the issue of Islamic extremism will continue to pose challenges for international affairs in the years to come. But it's good to have discussions like these to improve our understanding and knowledge. So on behalf of the AWIA, thank you for giving us your insights on these issues. Thank you very much for thank having you. us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Uh, thank you for joining us once again. For more informa information, please visit the AIIA website, which is www.internationalaffairs.org.au. Thank you.